In her book, What Your Mother Never Told You About Sex, Hilda Hutcherson, M.D., provides advice for women as to how to go about having sex with a man, about turning him on, so to speak. And we quote, You probably wouldn't like to have a lover immediately attack your clitoris when engaging in sex. Likewise, you don't want to rush to the penis right away. To make things interesting and to keep him guessing about your plans, start with him lying on his stomach. With your hands, massage his buttocks, back and neck, planting kisses along the way. Trace his spine with your tongue. To add spice, you might slip one hand between his legs and gently stroke his scrotum. Now, have him lie on his back so you have access to his front. Start with kissing his face, neck, chest, and nipples. Gently suck on the nipples, using your tongue to increase stimulation. Some men hate to have their nipples sucked. If you haven't asked him, look for cues to determine whether he enjoys nipple play. Alternate kissing and licking down to the abdomen, including the navel. Spend a little bit more time at the lower abdomen between the navel and the pubic bone, an area some men find super sensitive. As you near the genitals, brush your lips, etc. What is more pertinent to our presentation here today is what she says about nipples, men's nipples. In an article published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Roy J. Levin of the University of Sheffield and Cindy Meston of the University of Texas at Austin found that 51.7% of men and 81.5% of women enjoyed erotic nipple stimulation, causing, quote, enhanced sexual arousal, unquote. In an article in the International Journal of Medicine, published by the Japan Health Sciences University, Sachi Shrikata and Ayumi Hibino observed that, quote, retention of nipples in men has been a biological curiosity. We were intrigued by the fact that if nipples do not serve any function, why it failed to get lost, like tails, during the course of evolution in the past five million years. Nipples have two recognized functions in humans. The primary function is nutritional and present only in women. Allow me to say parenthetically that there have been reports of males lactating, but back to Kata and Bino. The secondary function of nipples is becoming an erogenous zone during sexual arousal. This function has been positively reported in both sexes, albeit in a lower percentage among men, 50 to 60 percent, in comparison to women, over 80 percent. According to Laurent Misery and Matthew Telagas, Laboratory of Neurosciences at Brest, University of Western Brittany, Brest, France, Hey, if you work in a city called Breast, that's a natural thing for you to study, right? Male breasts are much less studied than those of women. In men, breasts have only an erotic function. Because there is dense and very well-organized innervation of the nipple areoli, complex in men, nipple erection occurs frequently via different mechanisms from penile erection. Although it seems to be less important for men than for women, it is poorly studied. The erotic value of breast stimulation is notable. So guys, if breasts have only an erotic value for us, let's tell our girlfriends to go at it. 
In addition to what Hilda Hutcherson tells us, we'll have a lot more advice for the women in our lives later in this episode. But back to those percentages. Your host has known women who are members of that 19.5 or 20% of women who do not enjoy erotic nipple stimulation, while he himself enjoys it immensely. More on that later, but let us delve deeper into the relationship between breasts, and nipples in particular, and the erotic. In a book entitled The Erotic in Context, published by Oxford University Press, Ana Paroque Esquerdo writes of, quote, the erotic lived nipple as a source of incommensurable pleasure, sexual excitement, joy, and even orgasm for women. But what is this thing called a nipple, anyway? In an article by Emily A. Klein, published online by O School, she provides the following helpful explanations and advice. The nipples are highly sensitive and responsive to stimulation, making nipple sucking a great way to give and receive pleasure for folks of all genders. What is commonly referred to as simply the nipple is actually two structures. The nipple itself, which is a raised area with tiny holes that connect it to deeper tissues in the breast, and the areola, the relatively flat area of skin surrounding the nipple. The nipple and areola are usually darker in color than the surrounding skin and have an irregular surface. Most people have two nipples, but it's fairly common to have one or more extra nipples. Why, she asks, does nipple sucking feel so good? Nipples are made to be sucked on. During breastfeeding, tiny holes in the nipples allow milk to flow through ducts from milk-producing glands in the breast tissue. In response to a baby's suckling, the pituitary gland of a breastfeeding parent releases the powerful hormone oxytocin, encouraging milk to flow and promoting bonding and caregiving behavior. Even in people who are not breastfeeding, nipple sucking can stimulate the release of oxytocin, which also occurs during sexual arousal and orgasm. Oxytocin, sometimes referred to as the love hormone, has been found to reduce stress and increase sensations of trust and well-being. Because nipple sucking and oxytocin release are linked, nipple sucking may help to build feelings of closeness and intimacy with your partner. As well as encouraging oxytocin to flow, the nipples are highly sensitive to touch and temperature and often become erect in response to sexual arousal. The nipples don't have erectile tissue that fills with blood like the clitoris or penis. Instead, they get hard due to the contraction, pulling together, of specialized muscles below the skin, similar to what happens when you get goosebumps. Can you orgasm from getting your nipples sucked on? In people who have vulvas, the same region of the brain that is activated during stimulation of the clitoris and vagina is triggered by nipple stimulation. This suggests that the pleasure some people feel when having their nipples sucked is similar to that of direct genital stimulation. Some people have even reported that they can have an orgasm just from having their nipples played with. But let's take a moment to delve deeper into that matter of nipple orgasms. In reports by Kinsey, Pomeroy, Martin, and Gebhardt, 1953, Masters and Johnson, 1966, and Paget, 2001, women stated that they experienced orgasms from breast or nipple stimulation. Ernst Greifenberg, of G-Spot fame, claimed that, and we quote, kissing the nipples, touching them with the penis, or inserting the penis between the two breasts can lead to an orgasm, unquote. In a paper entitled Non-Genital Orgasms by Barry R. Komisuraka and Beverly Whipple of Rutgers University in the lush Garden State of New Jersey, they explain that the orgasm-inducing effect of breast or nipple stimulation may be due to sensory activity from the breast projecting to the same neurons that receive sensory activity from the genitals, specifically the neurons of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. In this article, the authors report the effects of women's nipple self-stimulation on the genital sensory cortex. Nipple orgasms? Did anyone say nipple orgasms? In an article published online in Healthline, 
by Anna Maria Saskaxia and medically reviewed by Janet Birto, PhD, LCSW, Certified Surgical Technologist, we learn the following. A nipple orgasm is possible through stimulation. There are many techniques and toys you can use on your nipples to have an orgasm. Your nipples are erogenous zones. It's possible for people to orgasm without even touching their genitals. That's where erogenous zones like the nipples come in. When played with, nipples can set off fireworks throughout your body. With enough stimulation, you can even reach that big O. Keep listening to learn more about nipple play, how you can get started, and what you can do to really turn up the heat. Mr. Sensuality encourages you to take notes. How is an orgasm possible? Thank your nerves. Each nipple has hundreds of nerve endings, making them super sensitive to touch, and playing with your nipples can bring you a lot of pleasure. When your nipples are stimulated, they shoot off sparks in the genital sensory cortex. This is the same area of the brain that's aroused by vaginal or clitoral stimulation. What does a nipple orgasm feel like? Many people describe a nipple orgasm as something that sneaks up on you and then explodes out of nowhere. The sensation spread throughout your whole body as the pleasure builds slowly and gradually. Then, bam! you'll feel a powerful climax that'll come in waves. A nipple orgasm may feel even more intense during menstruation. Hormonal changes during menstruation can increase breast sensitivity and tenderness, which may heighten arousal. Can everyone have one? In theory, yes, but it may take some trial and error until you discover what works for you, or the nipple plate may not be for you at all. The only way to know is to give it a try. And who knows, you may have a lot of fun. Wait, can men have nipple orgasms too? Yep, men can absolutely have nipple orgasms, so you can try out nipple play with interested male partners. <laughs> this is advice for women here, so, you know, girls out there, <laughs> hey, I'm interested. I'll be your exploratory subject. Talk with your male partner about what techniques they like to try, what makes them feel good, and what you need to avoid. The method is the same, and communication plus a sense of adventure is key. How to get started. Nipple play doesn't have to lead to orgasm. But if you're in the mood and want that endorphin rush, there are a few things you can do to help your body achieve the big O. Set the mood. By turning down the lights, lighting some candles, and listening to some sensual tunes, a sexy and relaxing settings can really get the mood going. As far as sexy tunes are concerned, I highly recommend my Concerto per Pianoforte Orchestra Dedicato ad Anita di Francesco on my Lendl Pitts YouTube channel. I compose this piece for the purpose of turning you on. Get into a comfy position. This helps you focus on feeling pleasure without feeling uncomfortable. Let your mind wander. Think about what turns you on. Fantasize can help you become even more aroused as you play around. And may I add, never hesitate to fantasize about people other than the person you are with. Check out my episode on fantasies. Take your time. Enjoy all the different sensations you feel from playing with your nipples and breasts. Experiment with techniques to find what makes you feel good. Start with your fingers. You can also add other sensations. Oils, lotions, clamps, and nipple vibrators can really ramp up the pleasure. I know that from personal experience. Man, an ex-girlfriend of mine ordered me some nipple vibrators. And man, oh man. Anyway, let one hand wander. You can explore your other erogenous zones or your clitoris. Even though you can achieve an orgasm from nipple play alone, why not make the experience explosive by exploring other parts of your body? How to pinch, stroke, twist, and more. You can try nipple play on your own or have your partner give it a go. Don't forget, you can do more than just play with your nipples. Exploring the rest of your breasts may help with arousal. If you're unsure where to start, you may find it helpful too. Start slowly by first focusing on your breath. Take long, deep breaths to help you relax and get out of your head and into your body. 
Breath is a key element of all sensuality and eroticism. We'll be talking about this more later on. Tease yourself by playing with other erogenous zones. Use your fingers and hands to stroke your belly. Then move on to your rib cage, and finally, around and between your breasts. But don't touch your breasts or nipples just yet. Let the sensations build up first. Use a light touch to circle your breasts and areola with large strokes. Then ease into a gentle breast massage. When you're ready, give your breasts a little squeeze. In between massaging and squeezing, trace your areola without touching your nipples. This will help build up anticipation. Now that you're hot and excited, move your fingers over to your nipples. They should be erect. Start rubbing your nipples slowly, increasing speed and pressure as you become aroused. Ramp up the pleasure by pinching your nipples. A pinch will send a rush of sensation throughout your body. The harder the pinch, the better, but play around with pressure to find out what feels best for you. Don't limit yourself to pinching. Try giving your nipples a slight twist or pull to see what gives you the most pleasure. Bring yourself to the edge of orgasm, but pull back, then repeat. Play with your nipples and rub your body to create waves of orgasmic pleasure that ripple through your entire body. Arch your back and rock back and forth as you let your hands wander. When you're ready, push yourself to your limit and let go. Enjoy the rush as you experience that big O. If you want to try with a partner, and why not, first practice by yourself and then bring in the partner. If you are a woman, that partner may be either male or female. It's like me practicing my bassoon first all alone and only then inviting my piano accompanist. With an accompanist, you are playing off each other, inspiring each other. That is when making music becomes really exciting. Or for an orgy, bring in an entire orchestra. Or do like in jazz. You start by yourself, the piano comes in, and then add a sax or a flute. Each player who enters the scene adds another dimension of sensuality. Jazz is very much like sex. You can learn a lot about sex from jazz and a lot about jazz from sex. But back to our online authority. All the text you'd use in a solo session can be followed when you are playing with a partner. But there are other things your partner can do to add to the experience, whether it's during foreplay or right before you orgasm during intercourse. If any of these techniques pique your interest, talk to your partner. Hot breath. Your partner starts by slowly breathing warm air around and onto your nipple to stimulate the nerves. As I mentioned before, I am really into this, giving and receiving. Breathing together is a fantastic way to build up to an orgasm. First, you and your partner should learn to breathe together as an activity not aimed specifically at anything erotic. And after you are truly in sync with her or him, then introduce breathing into your sex ploys. You will not regret it and you will be thanking Mr. Sensuality for a long, long time. Licking. There are so many ways your partner can lick your nipples. They can trace little circles around your areola, flick your nipple with the tip of their tongue, or use the flat of the tongue to cover more surface. I have been told that the tip of my tongue is like an electric charge, an electric spark, it is as if all the energy in my body and my spirit and my soul come together there. We'll talk more about the tongue later. And that tip on the end of my tongue longs to make fire, to set my partner ablaze, whether it ignites her tongue, her nipple, or clitoris, or any part of her, her ears, her neck, her back, her buttocks. So you, whatever gender you may be, should practice concentrating your energy in your tongue. Find your inner battery and direct its voltage and amperage there. It's a form of meditation or yoga. Learn to channel that deep inner spiritual slash corporeal energy to your nipples, your vagina, your clitoris, your G-spot, 
your penis, and, as we just said, the tip of your tongue. When I, as a man, enter a woman who has done this, I feel the fire which powers the contractions, the constrictions, the grasping of me in hot waves. However, back to our authority. Sucking. You don't have to limit it to just licking. Your partner can suck in your nipples, too. Having them draw your nipples into their mouth will stimulate extra blood flow and increase sensitivity. Nibbling. If you're into it, have your partner nibble a little bit on your nipples for added sensation. If you want a different sensation entirely, now that you know the basics, it's time to ramp things up. Add in some fun extras and really get things hot, whether you're solo or with a partner. Applying warming oils and lotions all over your breasts may enhance arousal during nipple play. Ice. Adding ice to nipple play can send chills throughout your body and cause an instant nipple erection. Vibes. Nipple vibrators are a great hands-free way to massage and stimulate your nipples as well as feel sensations throughout your entire breasts. Clamps. Clamps, whether vibrating or not, can tease and titillate your nipples by giving you versatility. You can wear the clamps loosely for a little bit of fun or tighten them to apply pressure and intensify arousal. Despite popular belief, stimulating your clitoris, vagina, or penis is not the only way to have an orgasm. Nipple play can also bring you to that big O. And there are so many ways you can stimulate your nipples to make that orgasm explosive. Experiment with techniques, find out what makes you feel good, and just have fun. This orgasm business can get really exciting, but there's even more. First, mouth orgasms. In his book, Liberated Orgasm, The Orgasmic Revolution, Herbert Arthur Otto tells us that, quote, the mouth orgasm happens at the peak of stimulation of the mouth, may begin in the mouth and or throat, and may expand from there. He claimed that the mouth is the primary human sensory organ, starting with suckling by infants. He stated that mouth orgasms appear to be triggered from the lips, tongue, roof of the mouth, and throat. He interviewed women who said they experienced orgasms while kissing and others while performing oral sex on a man. The women reported that the intense feelings of pleasure usually begin to build up in the lips, and then at that point of release, they could experience a whole body orgasm. Some women said that their orgasm moved from their mouth to their clitoris. More often, they described that it spread through their entire body, generating vaginal and uterine contractions. Otto reported that 41 of 205, that is 20%, women in his exploratory research reported having mouth orgasms. Otto described the occurrence of mouth orgasms also in men, both homosexual and heterosexual. He claimed that the mouth is a primary erotic zone and has the capacity of triggering its own unique orgasms. He reported that 26 of the 130, that is 20%, of men in his exploratory study reported experiencing mouth orgasms, claiming that they seemed more reluctant than women to describe such orgasms. On this podcast, we are huge fans of kissing and other oral erotic activities but kissing in particular. We spoke about kissing at length in our most recent episode, In Praise of Bisexual Women. Is a full-body oral orgasm possible? We would say yes. One last thing from Herb Otto's Orgasmic Revolution book. According to him, 9% of women in his study had reported having experienced anal orgasms, However, he does not tell us how many of these women had experienced anal intercourse. In the Kinsey Institute new report on sex, June Macover Reinish reported that as of 1990, the date of that book's publication, about 33% of women reported having had anal sex. So the percentage of women having anal sex is higher than the percentage of women who orgasm from it. A question for further research might be, do women enjoy anal sex if they do not orgasm from it? 
On the other hand, penetration sex in general, in and of itself, leads to orgasms in only a minority of women. So may we assume that there are many instances where a woman experiences an orgasm as a result of cunnilingus, and then the man has an orgasm by penetrating her anally? Cunnilingus, for those of you for whom this is a technical term that you may not use in your everyday vocabulary, this basically consists of one individual, in my case a man, but it could be a woman, uh, taking their mouth and tongue and lips down to the genital area of a woman and using their lips, their tongue, their mouths, that entire aspect of their being, to lick and suck and caress and feel and excite a woman's labia, her vagina, her clitoris, and her G-spot. That's what it is. And we endorse such behavior here on the Explore Ecstatic Sensuality podcast. But finally, back to nipples. Here are some suggestions Emily A. Klein gives us as regards to nipple fun. Use your tongue. The tongue is perfectly built for bringing pleasure to your partner during nipple sucking. You can make gentle circles around the areola with the tip of your tongue. Use it to stimulate the nipple itself or even lick the entire breast or pectoral area to increase anticipation. So much of sex, may I say as an aside, is about anticipation, thwarting it, doing what is not anticipated. We'll talk about a lot of this later. We'll talk about the need to avoid repetition. One anticipates something, but something else is done to one. I love that. Anticipation is kind of fun in a certain way because uh, the fun thing about it is when someone foils it. I love that. Okay. You can also play with the erect tip of the nipple with your tongue, circling and flicking it while you suck. Try sex toys for nipples. Nipple sucking feels great when you just use your mouth, but there are plenty of nipple sex toys meant to enhance pleasure even further. There are nipple suckers, nipple clamps, nipple pumps, and more. Change the temperature. Just as variations in pressure can increase pleasurable sensations during nipple sucking, changing the temperature can feel just great. Try taking a sip of warm tea before taking your partner's nipple into your mouth. Or try popping an ice cube into your mouth to instantly harden your partner's nipple and create a delightful shiver. Tease with your teeth. For some people, nipple sucking feels even better when the teeth get gently involved. Try softly raking your teeth from the base of the nipple to the tip. For those who prefer a little pain with their pleasure, nibbling and biting the nipples can feel amazing. Whenever you use your teeth, take great care to avoid biting too hard. And always ask for your partner's feedback to make sure what you're doing is more wow than ow. You ever you ever been intimate with a biter? Biters are an interesting species. I should do a separate episode about biters. Biters and scratchers. Biters, though, people who uh, for whom expressing emotion and such via biting is a big deal. We'll talk about that. Okay. Nipple sucking can be a great way to enhance sex or a satisfying intimate activity in its own right. Experiment with a variety of techniques to discover what feels best for you and your partner. If you're new to nipple sucking, or even if you're not, go slowly. Check in often and enjoy the experience. Add dual stimulation. When your nipples are being sucked, either by a partner or with a toy, pay attention to other erogenous zones. The great thing about using nipple suckers is that they will stay on hands-free. This means that you can easily use your hands to stimulate other areas of the body, like your clit or penis. Massage, stroke, or finger yourself, or have a partner do it for you, while their lips are wrapped around your nipples. All great advice in the opinion of Mr. Sensuality. We'll talk a lot more about toys and nipples later, but... First, let's take a look at an article entitled Couples and Kinky Sexuality, the Need for a New Therapeutic Approach by Margaret Nichols, Ph.D. 
She is a licensed clinical psychologist in an American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists certified sex therapist. A therapist, writer, and social activist for 40 years, she specializes in populations and topics ranging from feminist therapy to HIV to LGBT issues and work with the kink and polyamory communities. And we quote her. Sometimes, understanding how a practice produces pleasurable sensations helps quell the squicked feeling. Steel nipple clamps can look frightening, but they make more sense when one understands that, once the clamps are removed, the nipple is left exquisitely sensitive. Spanking and flogging make sense as well in the context of physiologic phenomena induced by extremes of sensation. The flow of blood to the surface of the skin, the rush of endorphins and other chemicals, create an experience known to BDSM practitioners as subspace, i.e. a psychologically submissive space. An experience often described as an out-of-body altered state like flying or floating weightless. This experience, which some people, including Mark Thompson in his well-known S&M book, Leather Folk, interpret as spiritual, can be deeply fulfilling on levels beyond sexual. Unquote. Heavy stuff. With the right babe, right for me, always including beautiful, smart, and sensual, I can really get into it. But back to how nipples can be key in maximizing pleasure, which, in case you haven't noticed yet, is the theme not only of this episode, but of this podcast. Journalist, sex columnist, and author Debbie Hebernick, Ph.D., is a well-respected sex therapist known for both her work at the Kinsey Institute and her writing, which has been published in the New York Times, Men's Health, Cosmo, and Marie Claire. She wrote, and we quote, Nipples are highly sensitive to touch, According to one study, 59% of women ask their partners to stimulate their nipples during sex. During sexual arousal, muscles throughout the body contract via a process called myotonia. The contraction of internal smooth muscles in the nipple is what causes women's nipples to become erect during arousal or when cold. A fun fact, myotonia is also responsible for the uterus lifting during arousal, making room in the vagina, toes curling during orgasm, and the facial contractions known as the O-face. Personally, I can think of nothing more inspiring, more fulfilling, in its own way, more spiritual than the O-face on a beautiful woman. It is my reward for bringing her to that cosmic state. And yes, orgasm for both women and men is a cosmic state. As we stated in our last episode, in praise of bisexual women, orgasm precedes essence. Reshaping a famous statement by the classic French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, before you experience a full-body orgasm, you merely exist. Your essence is yet to be formed yet to come into being. And from that point on, once you have your essence, that essence isn't static. To borrow an idea from another French philosopher, this time Alain Badiou, love is an event which can redefine everything, make you see everything differently, enable you to see the spiritual dimension in everything you experience, and make familiar things new and thrilling. And what is the highest manifestation of love? Orgasm. Each orgasm is an event. It is a radical opening of new doors, of new insights, of new horizons, of new galaxies. If you're just in bed huffing and puffing with someone, believe me, that ain't it. Sure, shriek, moan, tear the sheets, scratch and scream. But the soul of sex is the big O, the full body full spirit, oh. And just by the way, humans are not the only species who experience something like an orgasm. As Daniel Bergner puts it in his book, What Women Want, the rat does not think, I want to have a baby. Such planning is beyond her. The drive for immediate reward, for pleasure, 
And the gratification has to be powerful enough to outweigh the expenditure of energy and the fear of injury from competitors or predators that might come with claiming it. It has to outweigh the terror of getting killed while you were lost in getting laid. The gratification of sex has to be extremely high. Unquote. And how many of us feel the terror of getting killed while we are lost in getting laid? Well, I've seen a lot of films where that happens, and nobody says, please don't shoot us until we have an orgasm. On the other hand, what must it be like to die during orgasm? It is arguable that the actor David Carradine could have told us, but alas, look him up somewhere. While we're on that subject, German researchers reviewed 16,437 autopsies over a 25-year period, 1993 to 2017, and found that 74, about one-half of 1%, 0 .005, including 43 men and 31 women, had died while in the throes. Given the overwhelming similarities of sexual practices in Europe and the U.S., well, that can be debated, <clears throat> there's every reason to believe this study's findings also apply to Americans who die during sex. As Harry Crosby wrote, One is not in love unless one wishes to die with one's beloved. There is only one happiness, to love and to be loved. My dying words shall be a lover's sighs beyond the last faint rhythm of her thighs. Curiously, by the way, our sponsor, French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, says some pretty disparaging things about the female breast. It has been theorized that this is because he associated the prominence of breasts in psychoanalytic theories with Melanie Klein, whom we have discussed in several previous episodes. Lacan invokes Freud to suggest that the breast is only a stand-in for any desired objects, lacking significance of its own. At another point, the breast becomes a stand-in for the womb and everything we lose at childbirth. He even compares suckling to sucking and the infant's oral drive to the bloodthirsty drive of a vampire. You get the impression that Lacan would like to talk about anything but breasts. Unless, as he says at one especially lurid moment, he's talking about a waitress whose tits he presumes we all want to tickle. Odd ideas, Jacques, but we thank you for being our sponsor. All the same. However, <clears throat> to return to Debbie Hebernick's ideas about nipple stimulation. Peanut butter. You got it right. Peanut butter. Spread this on the nipples to make an excellent adhesive for chocolate nipple pastries. Make sure your partner doesn't have any nut allergies before going down this route, or you could end up in the emergency room. Unquote. You get a choice of two words here. Yum or yuck. Want some more ideas? Let's turn now to an article by Aaron Magner entitled, Breast Orgasms Are Legit. Here's how to have one tonight. And I quote, when most of us learn the rules of the hookup game, we were taught that second base isn't much more than a quick stopover on the way to home run. You wouldn't go all the way without expecting at least a little boob action, but for some reason, okay, the heteronormative patriarchy may have something to do with that, breasts aren't often considered a destination in their own right. Well, what I'm about to tell you might convince you to linger a little longer in center field. Breast orgasms are a real thing. According to holistic sex and relationship coach Kim Anami, they're just as dreamy as their below-the-waist counterparts. Quote, Breast orgasms feel like waves of pleasure throughout the entire body. Tingly, blissful, incredible pulsations of energy, she says. They're beautiful orgasms to have. That's not a total surprise, since the breasts have high concentrations of nerve endings and are a well-known erogenous zone. Scientists have found in MRIs that nipple stimulation and clitoral stimulation activate the same places in the brain, says Anami. There isn't any direct research on the hormones involved with breast orgasms, but if we infer from breastfeeding, oxytocin and endorphins likely play a major role. 
Anami also believes that there's major energetic action that occurs in a woman's body when she's getting felt up. In Chinese medicine, there are six energy meridians that go through the breasts, three of which are really associated with sexual arousal, especially the kidney meridian, she says. I think a lot of energy can get congested in the breasts. They're clearing houses for lymph, so when we're massaging and caressing them, any stuck, stagnant energy gets moving. Unquote. And while some folks without boobs can have them too, Anami says, breast orgasms are more universal among breast owners. We quote her, Scientists have found in MRIs that nipple stimulation and clitoral stimulation activate the same places in the brain. Kim Anami, holistic sex and relationship coach. The trick to making this magic happen, she says, is simply to give your tatas more attention, way more than you're likely used to. Just like with other orgasms, people spend a few minutes and say, nothing's really happening, I must be one of those people who can't do it. And that's not the answer, says Anami. Although, caveat, every person and every sexual encounter is different, so try not to put too much pressure on yourself or your partner to achieve any kind of big O. For the best chance of success, Anami says, devote a good 20 to 30 minutes to breast and nipple play. Massage and caress the whole surface of the breast for at least 10 minutes, then focus on the nipple with a light touch, varying the strokes. Don't touch any other part of the body. Just stay at the breast and nipple. It will come. You can enlist your partner to do the work or get handsy yourself. Either way, says Anami, the results will be the same. It may also help to sync your first try with your cycle. Nipples and breasts are often more sensitive during the premenstrual phase, she points out. If you want the momentum of that extra sensitivity, that would be a good time to explore. This could be an especially helpful tip if you've got breast implants, which Anami says can impact sensitivity. But the biggest perk of a breast orgasm may actually have nothing to do with the in-moment sensation. In our culture, breasts are almost for other people, Anami says. I think if women integrated more dedicated breast play into their sexual routines, they'd really come to own and love their breasts more. The more time and energy that we spend on all of our body parts, the better. I'm going to make a mini divagation here. When Kin Anami says, breasts are almost for other people, she means that they are like clothing accessories, part of the show, part of the projection a woman wants to make, the act she puts on. So on some occasions, women recoil from having their breasts touched because it is as if someone is pawing an item of their clothing. Think about that, and you realize that there is some truth in it. End of divination. The more time and energy we spend on all of our body parts, the better. To state the obvious, Melanie Klein or no Melanie Klein, guys like to touch women's breasts. When the lummox does it, the only thing in his mind is A, turn himself on, get hard, or B, make the woman excited so that she will give him a blowjob or a hand job or even a whole enchilada. What I say to both men and women is every contact you have with your sex partner's body should take place on all dimensions. Tactile, touch, the nerve endings in your hands and our lips and our tongue and our chest are sending signals up to your brain. Pleasure signals. Signals that report that as you touch or lick or rub or nibble, your sex partner's nipples are changing. Feel the warmth the inner vibration. Don't miss out. It's a feeling of shared power between two sex partners. And that power can go as far as you want it to go. To orgasm. And you know what? That's fine. Remember, male orgasm and male ejaculation are different. Ejaculation usually accompanies orgasm, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes the Indians and the Tantra people tell you that you should have some sort of sexual encounter without orgasm. 
As far as men are concerned, what they mean is without ejaculating. Well, fine. But just because you don't ejaculate doesn't mean that you shouldn't have an orgasm. You want to know what's great? For a couple to share a nipple orgasm, a full body nipple orgasm, and then after that, for the woman to have a vaginal orgasm while the man has another orgasm, this time including ejaculation. And two women can share nipple orgasms and follow those with a 69 position oral orgasm or a tribbing orgasm. You know, as we've discussed earlier, or perhaps in our previous episode, rubbing their their pussies together. Tribidism. What's on the menu for tonight? Multiple orgasm. So that's tactile. Then there's olfactory. Never lose awareness of the scent of your lover. Pheromones are being produced all the time, and especially during sex. This is the sort of thing that scientists have not studied so much, but they should. Pheromones are signals that constitute a language. Just as our sponsor Jacques Lacan says that the unconscious is structured like a language, so are pheromones. Breath is structured like a language. Caresses are structured like a language. Then there's taste. There are cultures and cuisines where a meal or other gustatory experience consists not so much of eating or chowing down or consuming as it does of experiencing a wide variety of tastes in small quantities. In my opinion, there should be more of them. Of course, remember that taste and smell are tied at the hip. There is only a limited number of things that we can taste solely through our taste buds. Humans have taste receptors on taste buds and other areas, including the upper surface of the tongue and the epiglottis. The gustatory cortex is responsible for the perception of taste. The tongue, back to our old friend the tongue, is covered with thousands of small bumps called papillae, which are visible to the naked eye. Within each papilla are hundreds of taste buds. The exception to this is the filiform papillae that do not contain taste buds. There are between 2,000 and 5,000 taste buds that are located on the back and front of the tongue. Others are located on the roof sides and back of the mouth and in the throat. Taste buds in the throat. Think about it. Each taste bud contains 50 to 100 taste receptor cells. Taste receptors in the mouth sense the five taste modalities, sweetness, sourness, saltiness, bitterness, and savoriness, also known as savory or umami. Scientific experiments have demonstrated that these five tastes exist and are distinct from one another. Taste buds are able to distinguish between different tastes through detecting interaction with different molecules or ions. We spend a lot of time in this podcast talking about the glories of the tongue. This will give you some idea of the complexity of this part of our anatomy. And the tongue speaks in many ways. When you kiss your partner, or whoever, you are communicating with your tongue. When you kiss your partner's vagina, or clitoris, or penis, as the case may be, you are speaking. Speaking in tongues, glossolalia, a phenomenon that occurs when a person experiencing religious ecstasy or a trance utters incomprehensible words that they believe are a language spoken through them by a god or deity. It is believed that a person speaking in tongues is temporarily being gifted the ability to speak a language they do not know. And what are you being gifted by when you speak in tongues during sex? In the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, to be specific, it was a gift from the Holy Spirit. For me, it is a gift from the shared spirituality created spontaneously by you and your partner during sex. And while we're at it, if you wish to speak in tongues in the biblical sense during sex, go right ahead. That can be an aspect of your shared spirituality with your partner. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, concerning whom we disagree in many respects, sets up a thought experiment in which someone is imagined to associate some recurrent sensation with a symbol by writing S in their calendar when that sensation occurs. Furthermore, it is presupposed that S cannot be defined by using other terms, for example, the feeling I get when the manometer rises. For to do so would be to give S a place in the public language in which S could not be a statement in a private language. 
This was one of the arguments that there is no such thing as a private language. But hold your proverbial horses. Two people having sex are creating a language spontaneously. Who says that to be a language it needs to last for any certain period of time? One of Wittgenstein's most famous or infamous statements was, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. If that were the case, how could two people, or three, whatever, have a shared spirituality created simultaneously during sex? Created spontaneously during sex. Everything during sex is outside our routine dictionary of nouns and verbs and adjectives, and it is unique to that encounter. Only in this way can we break through to the spirituality of sex, as we have discussed in our episodes on ancient Tantra and elsewhere, is insurpassable in human thought and experience. Every other relationship between people is logistical, mechanical, soulless, routine. Sex is all that counts. And if two people are a couple, by my definition, sex never stops. As I have mentioned in a couple of previous episodes, foreplay is everything that happens between orgasms. Because orgasm precedes essence. The next step of human evolution should be that we produce a world, a culture, a society, a mode of production and consumption, a mode of government that is based on pleasure, that makes pleasure the goal of all activities. And this should not be for an elite to the exclusion of the starving masses yearning to be free. And yet today, the fear of pleasure is everywhere. Would someone please explain this to me? H. L. Mencken defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. On one side, folks complicate things by talking about relationships and all that razzmatazz. And on the other, white folks are threatened by the idea that minorities are out there, maybe without a lot of luxuries, Teslas and homes and gated communities, and if they're pretentious, ludicrously overpriced California wines, but without the pleasures of the body and the soul, including sex. I lose track of what love means to those Tesla-driving white folks. Okay, I drive a Porsche, so I look down on them. Hmm. Let's start with sex and fun and hedonism in all the senses and stimulating companionship. And if the idea of love pops up, so be it. If you start out saying, I'm going to find God, a lot of people are going to say, here God is, you need look no further. But if you say, wait a minute, that's just marketing and control. I am going to find God on my own. And if you start out with that objective, goal and intent, you will never find it. It's something so big, if you run into it, you'll miss it. You've got ten dozen definitions of God or spirituality or divine power or grace floating around in your head. Well, love is the same way. If you have pleasure with someone, and that pleasure isn't routine or acting out some books or authorities ideas of what pleasure is supposed to be, and if you have a speaking in tongues kind of pleasure, with all your senses. And if you put your partner's pleasure number one on your agenda, even if that means having sex with someone else, then just maybe it's time to call what's going on love. The word sustainable has become real popular, and sometimes I wrinkle my otherwise unfurrowed brow and think about it for a second. I imagine it's like the conservation of matter and energy in the sense of being a closed system. So I am a little reluctant to use it when speaking about love. Love should be sustainable in the sense that it does not dissipate into one of those logistics relationships I keep talking about that are more like limited partnerships, more like business arrangements. Businesses produce a product. So do marriages. They produce 2.2 children necessary, if we are to believe that nonsense, to sustain life on our non-sustainable planet pleasure-love relationships, I have just coined a new term, and I like it, should be open to adding new ingredients. 
We all need to expand our sexual vocabulary. And yes, there are classes and workshops for couples that teach couples out there how to do that. But honestly, everyone you have sex with increases your sexual vocabulary. Because you go off and have Persian food one night doesn't mean that's all you want to eat from now on. That you don't want to make things you and your honey make most nights when you're at home. But you can eat the Persian food and come home and say, I had rice with Advia last night. It's a turmeric, cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, rosebuds, cumin, and ginger combination, and it's fabulous. <laughs> Let's try it. One of the best things about consciousness is our ability to learn, but not in a facile grade school or even Ph.D. sense. In the sense of, as I said a moment ago, of expanding and enriching our vocabulary, including our sexual vocabulary. And I'm going to stop for a second and say that doesn't necessarily mean putting names on everything we do. We have an experience and immediately go through the thesaurus and say, oh, it was this or that or A or B or C. We quantify it or we find some new qualitative judgment for it. That's not the kind of vocabulary I'm talking about. All right. I'm going to make a confession. If my sex partner is Anya, and I spend the night with Helen, and we have sex. The next night when I am having sex with Anya, that sex will be extraordinary, fabulous. Sex with a new person always charges my batteries. And if Anya spends the night with Giuseppe, and they have sex, or if she spends the night with Helen, and they have sex, the sex between Anya and me the next night will be out of this world. When I look at a couple or sex partners, even if they do not define themselves as a couple, who do the same sexual things every time they do sexual things, I feel sad. Even if someone says, it's okay, it's a ritual, I say, it's like eating prepackaged macaroni and cheese and drinking Charles Shaw Syrah every night. You'll burp the same way. It'll feel the same afterwards when you brush and floss your chompers. Freud opened the world's eyes when he said that the compulsion to repeat things, the Wieder Holensfang, is a mechanism of the death drive. For our sponsor, French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, the compulsion to repeat, articulated in terms of jouissance, is a genuine break from the pleasure principle. Over and over again, Lacan stresses that repetition is the basis of subjectivity, not intentionality. Man is driven to repeat what was structurally missed and not be guided by what brings satisfaction to his needs. Whoa, wrap your cerebellum around that for a while. If you do not have that glass of Trader Joe's Syrah and that macaroni and cheese and that orgasmless but not ejaculationless vaginal penetration sex, you will miss them structurally but your needs will not be satisfied. So-called fidelity is an adherence to a structure which may not satisfy your needs. And what does our sponsor, Monsieur Lacan, mean by jouissance, anyway? For Freud, what lies beyond the pleasure principle was the discovery of totistrib, the death drive. For Lacan, what lies beyond it is an excess of life an enjoyment beyond the pleasure principle. However, or in addition, mastering jouissance means loosening the bonds to the semblance, to the unattainable object that is infinitely deferred. This means not being stuck in the paradoxical curvature of the space of jouissance. This leads only to a kind of negative infinity. Jouissance, Lacan said, has to be refused in order to be attained on the inverse scale of the law of desire. Lacan saw dangers, if you will, in jouissance. We celebrate it. Jouissance is freeing oneself from the structure, and even, in a certain way, from desire, as it is generally thought of. In jouissance, we are no longer bound to the semblance, to the representation, the illustration, we are in that excess of life. I and my sex partner are in an excess of life. But back to more practical matters. 
That's how it goes. Expand your sexual vocabulary. Charge your sexual batteries. And when a couple can share and talk about and savor their outside sexual experiences, that's love. Returning to our example, if as things evolve so that Anya ends up with Giuseppe and I end up with Helen, that's okay. If Anya ends up with Helen and I end up with Kate, that's okay. If Anya and Kate and I end up in a menage, that's okay. But there is no such thing as ending up. Yeah, there's things like buying houses and making plans and settling down and so forth and so forth and so on. But the best kind of life is one in which our sex lives remain fluid and open and joyous and free in which we can never stop learning and never cease adding to our sexual vocabularies. Even I, as the host of this podcast and as someone who has lots of sex with lots of women because I enjoy sex more than anything, still has new words to learn, things that are beyond words, definable only in that moment, that moment of pleasure. And my fondest dream is that I never stop learning and that I never stop giving pleasure to women, and that women never cease giving pleasure to me. Unlike the animals, we can do it without fear, except in the movies, which happens to be my business, but we'll let that pass. We can do it with openness and joy. You know what I love? I love to meet a woman I've made a date with, no matter what its ostensible purpose is, and she's dressed in a way, as if to say to me, you're undressing me with your eyes. I would love for you to undress me with your hands, undress me with your lips, undress me with your cock. But that's my life, dear listeners. And it can be yours, woman or man, straight, like me, or, or gay, or bisexual. Doesn't matter. It can all be yours. And now, to conclude, more theory. In a presentation entitled The Breast and Female Sexuality, given at the 43rd Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Association in New Orleans in 2004, Friedel Fre of the Viennese Psychoanalytical Society said the following. Following Jean Laplanche's concept of the breast as an important female erogenous zone that not only feeds but also excites the infant, female or male, she, that is to say Friedel Fre, delineated why the sexual breast is not designated as a female sexual organ and plays such a little role in psychoanalysis. And that appears to have been the case even for our sponsor, Jacques Lacan. The concepts of eroticism and sexuality are, in most psychoanalytic thought, incongruent, said Freud. Concerning mature, quote-unquote, Vaginal female sexuality, the stimulation of the breast and the nipples are seen as an erotogenic starting point of the vagina's sexual arousal and as a defense against it, these being the thoughts promulgated by Sigmund Freud and Judith Kestenberg. Although Freud considers that, quote, perhaps the discovery of the genital zone, clitoris or penis, could have something to do with the withdrawal of the mother's nipple, Male phallic thinking excludes the idea of multiple excitability in regard to female sexuality. For an interesting, huh? French psychoanalyst Jeanine Chachet-Schmirgel stressed the importance of anal and oral excitement and of unconscious fantasies concerning the vagina. She presented, quote, an independent theoretical conception of the female body but persisted in the idea of one specific pleasure from one specific source. In contrast to phallic centrism, Friedel Freud, alongside the three sources of female excitation, breast, clitoris, vagina, conceptualized a threefold pleasure possibility, which is neglected in order to perceive only the nourishing breast. To quote her, I maintain that this ban on considering the breast as a sexual organ becomes apparent in the term erotogenic breast, instead of the breast being termed sexual. The erotogenic concept makes it possible to avoid the disturbing idea presented by the sexual breast. The specific excitation that characterizes the female breast has become subject to verdict, for the breast is the place where sexual passion and love of the child for the mother, or motherly love for the child, meet. 
It is at the nipple that the infant, that we, first experience love. Love both ways, giving and receiving. It is at the nurturant nipple where love and sexual passion meet. If you're in the mood to hear about the paranoid schizoid position, go back and listen to all of our episodes beginning with episode one. But for now, you've got your phone in your purse or in your pocket. Call someone you want to have sex with. When you meet, think about having sex with them. Project that aura to them. Get those pheromones pumping. And I promise, you'll both get lucky tonight.